This is just a picture, uh, or actually words, of what we have actually seen uh, globally in terms of observations in the past years consistent with the picture of global warming that has been forecasted for years. Um, the special report of intergovernmental panel on climate change, the uh, uh, events report of 2012, uh, puts it very bluntly. It is likely that man-made influences have led to warming of extreme daily minimum and maximum temperatures at global scale. So that's uh, uh, um, that's very likely. It is likely that there has been a man-made influence on increasing extreme coastal high waters due to the increase in mean sea level linked to um, the uh, ice, the polar um, the regions losing their ice um, and the global warming, the heating effect, the expansion effect. There is medium confidence that man-made influences have contributed to intensification of extreme precipitation, extreme rain and uh, snow at the global scale. However, uh, they also outline that there is increased confidence that uh, this has happened for uh, North American downpours. Uh, so rain becomes more intense. Um, there uh, is definitely increasing extreme water, um, coastal high water, and flooding from the ocean, uh, and there is warming uh, on the global scale. But also, there is medium confidence that heat waves have increased, so that's also uh, a sign of global warming, again observed. Um, and our extratropical nor'easters, which are storm, cold weather storms, of course, have started moving further north, uh, and there is low confidence in any observed. Uh, however, long-term increases in tropical cyclone activity, which means um, uh, hurricanes, uh, because they're saying there might not have been enough data um, to support it, given that there are not enough um, good um, uh, uh, good data for years in the past, and the, uh, the storms are not too frequent. Um, this is uh, an example of uh, the IPCC global economic scenarios that have been included in the IPCC reports, especially the 2007 report, um, and the global carbon emissions that are associated with them uh, all the way up to 2100 projections. Uh, there are three that uh, are usually used in environmental studies. Uh, there's the B1 scenario, that green line there is actually colored quite um, quite nicely, quite appropriately. It's that uh, for a convergent, um, globalized, sustainable, and service-oriented world, um, the uh, projections for, uh, uh, for carbon emissions are actually decreasing compared to now. Um, then you have the intermediate scenario of A1B, which is for converging, balanced fossil fuels uh, and other sources of energy uh, world with more efficient technology. And uh, finally, let me see if I can use this. Right. And finally, the uh, one of the worst scenarios, the fragmented, self-oriented, uh, growing population world uh, with uh, high increases in the um, carbon uh, dioxide emissions. And what does that mean? Is that in terms of projections now, we're going to projections, uh, the models uh, the, that have been uh, forced with this uh, carbon dioxide emissions also increases in global temperatures by 2100. Um, the, uh, less, the, the, the better green scenario also shows uh, uh, increases of about 1.8 degrees Celsius, so about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit or so, uh, and then the other two uh, have higher um, global temperature increases 2.8, 3.4 degrees by 2100. So the world is definitely um, uh, expected to be warming. Uh, projections also show uh, are consistent for global uh, sea surface temperatures. So our oceans are also expected to warm by the same kind of amount, 1 to 3 degrees Celsius by 2100. Now for sandy and our tropical cyclones, uh, the, predict the predictions are for average tropical cyclone maximum wind speed to likely increase in the North Atlantic hurricane basin, which you see here. Uh, so stronger hurricanes. Um, however, it is likely that the global frequency of tropical cyclones will either decrease or remain essentially unchanged, which is not something that you actually hear very, very much on the news. Um, the consensus right now, although it is uh, criticized and there are um, 
ongoing, there's ongoing research is for less hurricanes or the same number of hurricanes but much more intense in terms of wind damage and since wind, therefore surge and flooding. Uh, this is the uh, uh, December 2012, now published uh, Global Sea Level Rise Scenarios for the United States National Climate Assessment Report. Uh, the picture on the right, this is quite uh, recent, the picture on the right shows the um, uh, changes expected, uh, actually observed between 1992 and 2011 based on satellite measurements uh, of uh, sea level. So it's the mean sea level trends that have been observed by uh, top of Jason 1, Jason 2 satellites. Uh, red is uh, increasing water levels, blue is decrease. And I think that uh, this picture shows is that the, um, the mean sea level rise projections are now uh, for uh, the same everywhere. Somewhere, actually, uh, we have seen decreases in, uh, in water levels, and somewhere uh, in, in our neck of the woods, we have seen increases. And I will talk a little bit about what causes those reds right here, the increase in water levels. But I would like to uh, focus your attention on this summary uh, from NOAA 2012, we have very high confidence, about 90% chance that global mean sea level will rise at least 0.2 meters, which is 8 inches, and no more than 2 meters, 6.6 feet by 2100. That's a big range. 8 inches to 2100, to uh, 6.6 feet. Why is that such a big range? Because these are some of the scenarios that uh, have uh, been uh, uh, going into those assessments. And you can see here the global mean sea level rise in meters, and you can see there's a huge range, really between 0.2 meters and 2 meters uh, for each scenario. Um, this scenario right here includes, the 2 meter scenario includes the, um, the rapid ice melting uh, that uh, you um, are probably familiar with. So this is a time series of uh, those scenarios that NOAA has created. This is basically the lowest is an extrapolation of what was observed between 1990 and so on and before as a linear trend. Okay, just a linear extrapolation. And then these are scenarios that are between the rapid ice melt scenario by 2100, two meters higher water levels uh, and uh, uh, you have an intermediate low and an intermediate high scenario. This blue line here is what has been happening. If you focus right there, it actually right now tracking the intermediate high. Okay, intermediate high would be 1.2 meters. Um, they have been criticized for even including this lowest 0.2 meters uh, scenario. Uh, and uh, my understanding is that the reason for that is that. Uh, every single one of us, as a person, has different degrees of risk that we can, uh, uh, we can live with. So depending on how much risk you can actually live with and how much risk you can actually give uh, your folks that uh, it's down to can live with, um, you can uh, potentially consider all those possibilities uh, of, uh, for uh, uh, the range of sea level rise. Right. One other thing I would like to point out is that you also have vertical land movement, which could also, um, because of the uh, adjustment from the uh, previous ice age, that would add another seven inches on top of that, and another nine inches uh, because of uh, potentially weakening coastal circulation dynamic patterns. So that's a, on top of those, you might have in our region now in uh, the coastal. Uh, northeast US, uh, maybe another one foot or more by 2100, additional to these numbers. So these are observed mean sea level trends along the United States from 1854 to 2006 averages. And this includes all the, um, the different components of sea level rise, the, uh, what's called uh, isostatic adjustment, which is basically um, the polar ice, um, the, the, the adjustment from the previous uh, ice age, uh, uh, as include, including the warming effects in the polar ice melt 
And what you see is that we're, uh, most of the United States is out of the green, zero to three, uh, or, or zero to one feet per century observed, uh, except for the Mississippi Delta, and also uh, our area right here. We are on the one to two feet observed, uh, which is called uh, in recent, um, in recent uh, studies, the hotspot for the United States. We're calling it the um, uh, Mid-Atlantic hotspot for sea level rise. So you're familiar with this. Um, you have read the news. There was a big discussion. Is was Sandy actually influenced by um, global warming? Was it not? Uh, this is a picture that was taken in Hoboken, where I work. Um, somebody had scribbled "global warming is real" on this boat that. Uh, was brought up uh, ashore uh, by the flooding there, the uh, horrible flooding we had. And somebody, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know, I never saw if this was actually written or it was uh, a photoshopped, but it says global warming is real and so is Santa Claus. Um, the fact of the matter, however, is that Salinger et al., used geoscientists scientist in 2012, reported that the weakening of the coastal currents, the uh, Atlantic Meridional uh, overturning circulation, which is an idea of coastal currents, coastal circulation, which, which was predicted two years ago uh, before him by Yen, is already having an impact in accelerating sea level rise rates in the mid-Atlantic hotspot. Um, and also, part of the 5 degrees Fahrenheit east coast sea surface temperature anomaly, the waters uh, that Sandy was moving through were about 5 degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal may have been due to man-made uh, global warming. Uh, this picture here shows that the observations, which is the black line for the increase in, in uh, uh, global temperature, are now actually tracking very well the third uh, assessment report from IPCC. Uh, and therefore we have quite good, uh, and a quite good understanding that um, what was happening uh, might very well have to do with global warming at least part of what caused Sandy. At Stevens, we ran uh, computer models of the environment since 2006 with, uh, under the uh, guidance uh, of Alan Blumberg, who I introduced before, uh, to uh, observe and predict the um, uh, weather, currents, uh, flooding, waves, and water quality for a seven-state region. <coughs> uh, this is the model grid. Uh, we call this the New York Harbor Observatory Prediction System. Alan is very uh, common uh, to see to see them uh, in the news, CNN, and this CNBC, and so on, as well as local news, explaining uh, what will happen in the next two or three days uh, uh, with regard to flooding. Uh, for example, he was uh, drafted uh, a lot during Sandy uh, because we do forecasts of storm surge dynamic storm surge and what would happen uh, in the next uh, 72 hours uh, with regard to flooding at all these stations right here. We call this the storm surge warning system. Uh, there's the link. You can go and uh, uh, put your email there and get notifications, uh, automatic notifications, emails, whenever we predict flooding in the next uh, eight hours. And you can see what happened with Sandy. This is major flood level right here at the battery. Um, so the um, major flood levels were actually uh, overtopped by a lot <coughs> during that storm. So a question that we asked, because we have the model, we can do a lot of projections, a lot of, we can play around with different uh, situations, different uh, scenarios, right? Um, so one of the questions that we asked was, we know that Sandy happened uh, when we had low waters, low tidal waters in Long Island Sound and the Upper East River, while it, wasn't, while it coincided with high tide at the bottom. Well, what if it actually had occurred, right, which is a very possible scenario, just seven or nine hours later, earlier, it just had tracked seven or nine hours later, uh, earlier, and it had coincided with a higher high tide for that day. Okay. Could we, could some of us actually have been very uh, lucky in our unlikely situation with Sandy. Uh, and this is a very scary scenario. If, uh, if Sandy had tracked nine hours or seven hours earlier, you would have had about three and a half more feet 
of water in Upper East River and Western Land Sound all the way to the Central Sound. Three and a half more feet of water. That's based on the dynamic models that we run. There's an example of that med shift uh, to higher waters in Long Island Sound and uh, the Kings Point area, which we uh, used for the most part. These are wind vectors. I apologize for the resolution of the image, but these are winds blowing this direction. Um, this is water level as it tracks with um, the surge from Sandy over several days, building up the storm, the made up storm, which would have happened uh, about seven hours earlier. And these are uh, pressure um, uh, contours. So you see, sand is coming in. The colors are showing surge. Do you see that? It stays there too. So this is um, the kind of effect that you could very possibly have had. It's not a, a crazy scenario to actually assume that it would have just come up seven hours earlier. And this is a difference between the flooding that you have. We have in that sense, the red spots right here would have been more flooding. Others would have been more lucky in that circumstance uh, around the city, because in that case, they wouldn't have coincided with higher waters. They wouldn't have coincided with higher waters. This is what Sandy actually did in Upper River, and this is what it would have looked like. Back and forth. <clears throat> All right. So, um, we actually tried to compare those uh, with the flooding, um, the flooding that we calculated based on dynamic uh, model with the FEMA um, uh, base flood elevation maps. Uh, so this is an example of our uh, models at the battery. <coughs> and this is what FEMA is saying in terms of the 1 in 100 year um, elevations and the one in 500 year elevations, which now we are supposed to say it's the 1% chance of any, any of this occurring every year, any given year, uh, and this being only 0.2% chance of this happening every given year, which is a more, a better way of thinking about it. At Westchester Creek, the story is that Sandy itself was actually less than one, based on this comparison, was actually less than one hundred year storm. But if it had occurred over seven, um, seven hours earlier, or seven hours earlier, it would have been about a four hundred year storm, once in four hundred years. For the battery, it was the opposite way. It was in one four hundred year storm for the battery. And if it had occurred seven hours earlier, it would have been about a one hundred year storm. So very dynamic. It gives us all hopefully pause of what actually that means, um, that all means in terms of um, the dynamicism of the system, right, and the flooding. Another thing that we're doing with Rutgers, uh, with the uh, University of uh, uh, in New Jersey, uh, was, this was Irene, the track of Irene, this is the track of Sandy, uh, and we created uh, what we call Sandine. Um, <laughs> So again, it's another scenario, right? Uh, the scenario here is, um, what if Sandy actually was coming in uh, the same way that it was coming in right now, but it was going over sea surface temperatures that were about eight degrees higher, which was what Irene was tracking uh, back in August of 2011. Uh, and that, of course, would create a much stronger system, about 10 knots more winds, because of that higher heat energy um, from uh, the uh, higher uh, water temperatures of Irene. <clears throat> and what would that mean? There's a slide that I put together that I call the models of three feet that puts together all those scenarios plus the sea level rise scenarios. Um, so at King's Point in Western Long Island Sound, this is where you are at the highest normal tide any given day. That's the mean high, high water. Highest normal tide. Sandy was about 6.5, I'll call it 6, we're all friends, um, of higher than that normal time, right? Another 3 feet or so would have been uh, there if it was at previous high tide. Actually, it's 3.5 feet, but anyway, another 3 feet. If it had come with Irene's SSD, you would have another 3 feet. 
if it come, would have come in 2100 under the median sea level rise scenario, another three feet. And if it was with a high sea level, that, and that's where we are right now. Remember, that's what we're tracking right now with no, the, the no report. If it had come with the high sea level rise scenario of the fragmented world, that would have been another three feet, 18 feet from normal high tide. You can break that in any way you want. You can eliminate the iron as a ski, you can eliminate the previous high tide, but you're still going to have uh, a lot of flooding. So this is what Sandy did, the blue area right, right here in uh, Long Island Sound. And this is with um, uh, three, oh, I'm sorry. And this, and this here is what will have how if it had happened in just with 3.6 feet of mean sea level rise at 1,100. What would that mean? Well, this is Stanford. If Sandy had come seven hours earlier in 2,100, the hurricane barrier from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers would have been overtopped. And therefore, you would have had the 1938-1944 event to remember in Stanford. In fact, even if it had come just seven hours later, earlier, without the 2100 condition of 3.6 feet, it would have been very close within inches of the design still water elevation for that dam, for that uh, hydrogen diagram, I'm sorry. And this plot here shows that uh, this is recurrence intervals, those one a hundred, a thousand year storm, one a hundred a year storm. What it means is that uh, based on the uh, research of Lynn et al. 2012, is that in the future we'll have those storms like Sandy um, happening much more frequent than now. For temperature trends, uh, we have uh, warming in the uh, uh, river, well, not only SSTs, uh, sea surface temperatures and uh, global air temperatures, but also river water temperatures have increased. Uh, in um, the uh, Washington area, uh, but also, how about something closer, like Long Island Sound? These are data from Penny Hollow uh, that we've gotten. These are um, trends of bottom water temperature from March to June <coughs> in the last 20 years observed. And this is the Millstone Power Plant intake water temperatures for the last 35 years or so an increasing trend of also long and sound temperatures. Um, and those changes in the temperatures that we now see, not only in the global temperatures, but also in the air temperature and the uh, sea temperatures, but also in the water temperatures of the receiving waters, uh, in this case long and sound, uh, has great effects, uh, we believe, in uh, habitats for fish. Um, this is a project that uh, we're involved with, with the NOAA Science and Technology Marine uh, Fisheries Service, Rutgers, ourselves, uh, UMass Boston, and the whole Maracuz community, the Mid-Atlantic Regional Association for Coastal Observations, um, which is a multi-component um, agency for from the whole Mid-Atlantic, includes a lot of academics. Uh, and this is a model that uh, they put together, along with fish marine conservation uh, in uh, talking with fishermen at the same time, they, they sat down and they said, okay, what is the most important thing for finding fish, do you believe? Uh, and, and being able to track the fish, right? What is, so that in another words, in other words, we're actually saying, what is actually controlling the habitat of this fish, right? And you can see that bottom temperature, that decline is the increase in skill when you include bottom temperature in the variables that you are thinking of uh, in terms of where you can actually find fish. is the most controlling uh, part. So we have a new project right now um, called Analyzing History to Project and Mile of the Future from uh, funds from EPA, simulating the effects of climate on Long Island Sound, physical environment, and living mass marine resources, <coughs> where we're supposed to simulate with our model the Long Island Sound physical environment from the 70s on. Um, so we will recreate the, um, the Sound's environment from the 70s on with our NACOPS 
high resolution model which is full 3D physics and then explore those links between habitat changes, climate and living marine resource regime shifts. The idea here being that, um, for example, we see, as uh, it was mentioned before and was uh, printed uh, uh, in the uh, peer review literature by Howell and Oster, that you do have warm water species moving uh, in our area and cold water species moving further up north towards the Gulf of Maine. Uh, we believe that this might have very well to do with, um, you know, with changes in the climate. Those changes might or might not be long term. They might have to do with the, our data sets are not uh, uh, very back in time, uh, going very back in time. Um, we, it might actually have to do with cyclical changes like the El Nino, um, Southern Oscillation and so on. So we're, try, we're going to try to find out whether it's a long-term shift and in 50, 60, 80 years we'll have this shift continuing or um, it's just uh, something that uh, will ameliorate in the future. And then, what I'm talking about the future, simulate the Long Island Sound ecoscape over the course of this century, meaning all the way to 2100, by coupling Nighthawks to IPCC class global climate models from NOAA GFDL work and say by his work works at to inform management and adaptation. Um, those models are uh, now CM2.5, is the, this is the resolution, um, and I will show you what it predicts. What it predicts for temperatures right now you see that it doesn't include the sound very much in that resolution and that's where we are coming in from Stevens but you see that red is warmer temperatures of up to 5 degrees Celsius um, the uh, scenario that they are running right here is for 70 years of linear increase doubling of the uh, CO2 emissions uh, from 1970 on all up to 2040 and then from 2040 to 2120, just keeping them constant. Okay, so you definitely see that hot spot. And um, as uh, as you would expect, hopefully. Uh, 